All right, let's talk about the definition of probability. Okay, so now in this section, we're going to start getting into actually calculating some probabilities. But, okay, let's remind ourselves, first of all, what is probability? So just like we said before, probability is a measure measure of the likelihood likelihood that an event will occur that an event will occur okay. all right so going back to our coin tossing experiment from the previous lecture um, what was the sample space? Okay, so you toss a coin, your sample space is just either heads or tails. Right? Those are the, um, those are the set of possible outcomes. So a sample space, remember, is the set, the set of all possible outcomes. Okay, so for a coin, it's just heads or tails. So if the coin is unbiased, then each outcome is equally likely, right? So we have two possible outcomes, and one event is heads and one event is tails. So the probability of heads is 1 over 2, right? One event is heads out of two possible um, outcomes, right? probability of tails. One event is tails out of two possible outcomes. All right? Well, that's easy enough. You probably already knew that, right? <laughs> so this is an example of theoretical probability because we didn't have to do a bunch of trials to figure that out. We know there's only two outcomes because it's a coin and we have experiences with coin tossing. So um, theoretical probability is is calculated, okay, calculated um, not based on like an experiment or trials. You're using, it's calculated using, oops, using your knowledge, knowledge of a situation. Um, maybe some logical reasoning, some logical reasoning, and, or you might use a formula, a non-formula. But, so, so like now obviously we didn't use a formula, we, we just used some reasoning that, you know, we were tossing a coin, two possible outcomes, and the heads and, heads and tails are equally likely, so one out of two events is head, one out of two events is, is um, tails. Alright, so that's an example of theoretical outcome. But, um, a lot of times we can't calculate um, the probability of something uh, theoretically like that, okay? We have to do some trials. Okay, so for example, if we were, uh, if we wanted to know the probability of, of um, you know, maybe in quality control, and you want to know what's the probability that a part is going to be defective, the only way that we can um, figure that out is by testing parts and trying to figure out how many, uh, uh, how many of those parts are defective. So now we could actually, we could actually uh, calculate um, the probability of heads or tails by testing a bunch of coin flips as well. So that's what this table is showing. You know, we could uh, perform an experiment where we toss the coin 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 times and just record the number of heads. Okay, now this is just, you know, somebody's result, okay? 
um, of, of actually testing coin tosses. Okay. And, um, now, and then you can see over here, they've, they've calculated the relative frequency of heads. Okay. So, so four out of 10 coin tosses were heads. So the relative frequency for that, for those 10, uh, tosses is, is 0.4. Okay. Four tenths. All right. Now, as a percentage, it'd be 40%, but yeah, so it's just four tenths. No, it, um, for the most part in this chapter, we're going to be dealing with de a decimal representation of, of, um, probability. So, um, and not percentages so much, but, um, so anyway, this is, this is, uh, four tenths. The relative frequency is four tenths. And then they tossed a hundred times, got 58 heads. So that relative fre frequency is, um, 0.58. Okay. So they're just taking the number of heads they got divided by the number of trials. Okay. So relative frequency, we can just write that down here. It's just the, the number of trials in which um, the event we're interested in, the event, obviously the event occurs. Okay, the number of trials in which the event occurs, and then we're going to divide that by the total number of trials. Okay, so that's what they're doing up, up above, is just taking the number of trials that gave us heads divided by the total number of trials to get the relative frequency. Okay, and... Um, so there's something else called empirical probability. We talked about theoretical probability. Empirical probability, this is an example of empirical probability. Um, emp empirical probability is based on observation. Okay, so um, we can define empirical probability to be to be the relative, re relative frequency. So it is the relative, relative frequency frequency um, of an event over a large, large uh, number of trials. Okay. So, um, now if you were to perform this experiment yourself and you tossed a coin 10 times, it's probably not likely you're going to get just four. You might get five, you might get six, you might get two heads. All right. So over a small number of trials, the relative frequency is not a very reliable measure of probability. You, but as, as you increase the number of trials, you see how the, the empirical probability is approaching one half, 0.5, um, which is what we got for the theoretical probability. So empirical probability is only reliable over a large number of trials. So that's important. We need to do a large number of trials. Okay. So, all right. Let's go on here. All right, so in general, the probability of an event is a measure of the proportion of time that an event will occur in the long run. So in the long run, there's like you know, a large number of trials, okay? And probability is always between zero and one. Okay, zero and one. So one corresponds to 100%, right? Zero is zero percent, right? So um, probability is always going to be between zero and one. A probability of one is a certain event, and the probability of zero, or sorry, a probability of zero is an impossible event. That means there's a zero percent chance it's going to happen. And of course, a 50 percent chance is just, it's basically even odds. You know, your, your likelihood of one is the same as the likelihood of the other event. And, you know, the higher the probability, the more certain it is, the lower the probability, the less likely it is. So. All right, let's define another term here. 
that we're going to be using. Simple, a simple event, a simple event. So we're going to define a, a simple event to be an event that consists of exactly one sample point. Okay, um, in the sample space, in the sample space, sample space. Okay. So remember what a sample point in is. A sample point is one element in the sample space. Okay, so it's just one of the possible outcomes. All right. So a, a simple event is basically a single outcome. All right. So if we're talking about our coin tossing experiment, you know, our sample space was heads and tails, right? That was our sample space. That's the set of all possible outcomes. So, oops, so, um, the uh, simple events, simple events are, are just those single event, or single outcome events, I should say. Heads and tails. So the event of heads, and the event of tails, those are the, those are the simple events corresponding to the coin tossing. Okay. Now, the important thing about simple events is that they're mutually exclusive. All right. So they can't happen at the same time. Right. I can't get a heads and a tails at the same time. So that is advantageous when we're working with probability. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But okay, let's define something called a probability distribution. So a probability distribution is just the distribution of probabilities. Makes sense, right? So it's the distrib distribution of probabilities of all the simple events. Of the simple events of an experiment. Okay. I'll just leave it at that. All right. And normally we're gonna we're gonna put that in either a table form and sometimes we use a graphical form. In this chapter we're just gonna work with a table form. Okay. So this table over here, this table three from your book is an example of a probability distribution. Now it's really generalized. Um, we're assuming that we have some experiment where the simple events are S1, S2, S3, all the way up to Sn. So we have n simple events and the corresponding probabilities are just listed in the table. So whatever S1 is, um, the probability of S1, we just put in the table like that. Okay. Now there's also something called a probability function. I'm just going to put it, um, put it here, as define it for you, but we're not really going to work with probability functions um, at this point. Probability function um, is a function that, that assigns a probability to each simple event. So this would be like an equation that we would actually put in the event and get out um, of the probability. So, okay, so it's a function that assigns signs a probability, probability to each simple event. Okay, so we're not going to worry too much about probability functions at this point, but let's do the, our example of a coin toss and let's show what the probability distribution would look like. Okay, so we're just going to make a table of the simple events. Simple event. And the corresponding probability. Okay, and we're just going to put it in table form. Put 
put it in table form. So our simple events are heads and tails. Okay. Now I could put them in brackets because they, they are essentially sets. So I could put them in brackets. Now a lot of times I'm not probably not going to. I will for just completeness, completeness here. But so our probability of heads is one half, our probability of tails is one half. Okay, so that's all there is to it. That's the that's the probability distribution for our coin flip. Okay. Alrighty. So let's move on. Okay. Properties of probability. All right. All right. So first of all, I'm just going to write the prop this this property, and then we'll talk about what it means. Okay. So the first property is we have a probability of an event. I'm just going to call it S I. Okay. Is between zero and one. All right. So what does that mean? What does that mean? All of that saying is that for any um, simple event, a single simple event, all right, probabilities are between zero and one, which we kind of already figured out. Probably, uh, we already talked about that. So, and this makes sense. It's either certain, it's somewhere between certain and, and impossible, <laughs> right? So, um, one is certain, zero is impossible. So, the probability of any event is, is somewhere between zero, um, impossible, and certain. That just kind of makes sense. All right, so next property is one plus the probability of S two plus and so on all the way up to probability of S N. Okay, oops, should be doing that. This should be curve right. Okay, so if we add up all the probabilities of all the simple events, we will get one. Okay. And that kind of makes sense, too, because we're certain that one of the events in the sample space is going to occur. So if we add up all the probabilities of those sample points, which are all the outcomes in the sample space, we should get a 100% chance that one of those, something's going to happen, right? <laughs> if we perform an experiment, something's going to happen. And if our sample space is complete, then something in the sample space is going to happen with, with absolute certainty. Okay, that's basically what that's saying. That something in the sample space is going to occur with 100% certainty. Okay. Next property. All right, these are kind of cryptic because they're written very mathematically. But um, SI, okay, so um, union SJ. Okay, Probab so this is just saying probability of event i or event j, okay, probability of one of those two things happening, or, remember this is or, union is or, is just the probabilities of those simple events, s i, added together, s j. Okay, okay, and where i is not equal to j, of course. All right. So what's that saying? So that's just saying that the probability of event i or event j, that's what this is saying, probability of, of event i or event j, this is simple, simple event i and simple event j, the probability that either one of those occurs is just the sum of the probabilities of each event. Okay? And if you think about this, so the nice thing about um, simple events is that they're mutually exclusive. Okay? We couldn't do this. We could not add these if they were not mutually exclusive. But since they're single events, we can't have both of them happening at the same time. So we can just add up the probabilities. Okay? So that works because simple events are mutually exclusive. All right? And that's the nice thing about breaking things down into simple events is that the then we can just add probabilities. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. It's a little cryptic, and we'll do some we'll do some work with this in a minute. Uh, I'm going to define another thing called the uniform sample space. And a uniform sample space is just a sample space where each outcome, each outcome in the sample space, outcome, 
uh, in the sample space. is equally likely is equally like likely okay that's what a uniform sample space is so for example our coin toss is obviously a uniform sample space because our two outcomes are heads or tails and each one is equally likely okay and so and if we have a uniform sample space then the probability of any single um, sample point, any single um, a simple event, okay, is just 1 over n, because we have n, n um, possible outcomes, each one is equally likely, so the probability of any one simple event is 1 over n. Okay, so, you know, again, that's written fairly generally. Let's look at another example of this, which is rolling a die, because we're rolling a six-sided, I'm assuming a six-sided die, okay? So when we roll a die, the sample space is just going to be one or two or three or four or five or six, okay? All right, because there's only six possible outcomes, all right? Now let's find the probability distribution. So we're just going to list all the simple events. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so the simple events will just be um, single outcome events. And the probability, because there's six possible outcomes, the probability of each one is just one sixth, right? One outcome out of six, and they're all equally likely. So that's a pretty boring looking probability distribution, but that's a probability distribution nonetheless. One sixth. Okay. All right, so there's our probability distribution. So what's the probability of rolling a 3? Well, you can read that right off the table, 1 sixth. All right, so this is where we're going to apply some of our properties. What's the probability, probability of rolling a 1 or a 5? Okay, I'm leaving out the brackets here. I mean, technically there should be brackets around sets, but this is, <laughs> it gets kind of messy looking if I put too many brackets. All right, so the probability of a 1 or a 5 is just going to be the probability of 1 plus the probability of a 5, right? We can add them up. They're simple events. So we get 1 6 plus 1 6, which is 2 6, which we can reduce to 1 3rd. All right, um, what's the probability that the roll shows an even number? Okay, so the probability of, I'm just gonna write even, but we know that it's the union of all the simple events that are even, so two, four, and six. So it's the probability of two, four, or six. So we can add the probabilities. Probability of two plus the probability of four plus the probability of six. And again, we're just going to add up a bunch of 1 6. 1 6 plus 1 6 plus 1 6 is 3 6. Okay, and we can reduce that to 1 half. So the probability of rolling an even number is a half. All right, easy enough, right? <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at another example involving a uniform sample space. This one's a little more complicated. We looked at this last time. We looked at rolling, uh, rolling a die. Okay, rolling. Oh, sorry, a pair of die. Okay, so we're rolling a pair of dice. Um, now we're rolling two dice. And I've already, I've listed the sample space out for you because it's kind of a pain to write. Um, and and here it is graphic. Here it is as a picture. You can see all the different pairs of dice that we could possibly get. So these are all the possible outcomes. So if we want to calculate the probability that the two dice show the same number, okay, let's find that first of all. Where is that? That's going to be here. 1, 1, 2, 2, uh, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6. Okay, so I'm just going to kind of circle that if I can. All right. So this is 
part A, that's, that would be our event for part A. So you can see how many, how many um, simple events do we, do we have in that, that event? Or how many, yeah, how many <laughs> sample points do we have in that event? We've got six sample points, right? So we get six possible outcomes out of how many possible outcomes? Well, we've got a, basically a table here that's six by six. So that's 36 possible outcomes. And they're all equally likely. That's important, right? So our, the, um, so the, the total number of outcomes is 36. Each one of these outcomes is, has a probability of 136. So we could just add up 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136. Okay. There's six of them. So it's just going to be six out of 36, which we can reduce to one sixth. So the probability that the two dice show the same number is one sixth. All right. Next one asks us to calculate the probability that the sum of the numbers of the two dice is six. All right. So let's just go up to our sam sample space and find that find that event and find that event and it's oops right here so this is the event sorry it's kind of messy my circle is kind of messy this is the event for part b um the event of rolling a six it could be five and one four and two three and three two and four one and five so that's the event of rolling a six and we have one two three four five okay five simple events that we could break that down into, right? So our probability is just going to be five. Well, it would be one six plus one six plus one six plus one six plus one six, right? But that's, or sorry, sorry, I said that wrong. Um, <laughs> it would be one thirty six plus one thirty six plus one thirty six plus one thirty six plus one thirty six. Okay, we could add that all up, but we're going to get five thirty six. Right? And now that doesn't reduce. There's no common factors between 5 and 36. So that's just our answer right there. 5 36. All right. So now let's calculate part C. Calculate the probability that the sum of the numbers of the two dice is 4 or less. Okay. So now we're looking for the event where the sum of the two numbers is 4 or less. All right. So 1 and 3. These are all 4 right here. 1, 3, 2, and 2, 1, and 3. But we're looking for less than 4. So we're actually going to take this whole event right here. Any of those, this is part C, any of those events, out, or any of those outcomes in that circle um, would give us a roll of less than 4. 4 or less, actually. It says 4 or less. So 4 is, four is okay. If it said less than 4, then we'd would that would be not equal to four so that would be a different problem but it says four or less so four is okay so how many how many sample points do we have in that event one two three four five six so we have six sample points so it's going to be 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136 plus 136 six okay so we have six times 136 so six out of 36 Six out of thirty-six outcomes are less that are four or less, and so that reduces to one sixth. Okay, and so our final question related to this um, example is to calculate the probability that both dice show an odd number. Okay, now that was a little bit harder to circle in my little sample space, so I'm just going to write it out. So we want our our event is the event of getting two odd numbers, right? So one comma one, that's, that's a, that's a pop, that gives us two odd numbers. One comma three, and one comma five, those are all events or sample points that involve two odd numbers. Three comma one, uh, three comma three, three comma five, okay? We would have um, 5, 1, 5, 3, and 5, 5. Those are all of the 
sample points in our, in our sample space that involve two odd numbers. So our event has nine outcomes in it out of 36. Okay, so the probability of this event that we've just defined, okay, of having two odd numbers is going to be 136 plus 136 plus 136. Okay, you got the idea. So, and there's nine of them, so nine out of 36, which is one fourth. So our probability of getting two odd numbers is one fourth. All right. All right. So now we're moving on to some examples of empirical probability. Okay, so we've just been doing a couple of examples involving theoretical probability and um, uniform sample spaces. Okay, so this is an example of empirical probability. I'm just going to write that here. Empirical probability. Okay, so we're just, we're gonna, we did two examples with theoretical probability. Now we're going to do two examples with empirical probability. Okay, so so this is um, in this problem we have a study on stress experienced by Americans. They um, surveyed 800 adults, 18 and older, and they were asked to rate their stress level low, me uh, medium, uh, or extreme. And the results of the survey are shown in this table. Okay, So the first question just asks us to uh, to determine a probability distribution. So if you remember this, we're just assigning probability to the outcomes or to the simple events. So all of our simple events are low, medium, extreme, and no response, because apparently some people did um, decline to answer. All right. And if we add all of these up, right, we saw 272 answered low, low stress, 352 answered medium, 160 answered extreme, and 16 answered um, no response, gave no response. If you add that all up, add up all those responses, it adds up to 800, which we like to see because that's what it says here. That's how many were surveyed. So it's always good to check and make sure that everybody got accounted for. All right, so now we're going to calculate the relative frequency. That's going to be our probability, is the relative frequency. Now we're going to assume that 800 is a large enough number, <laughs> you know, that we can get a reliable probability. Um, so, in order to count the, calculate this probability for the probability of low stress is going to be 272 out of 800, right? So it's the number of trials of that event that gave us that event over the total number of trials. So now I'm going to write that as a decimal. So that's 0 0.34 when I calculate that out. And we're just going to keep doing that for each each of these simple events. So 352 answered medium stress out of 800. Okay, so that gives us a probability of 0.44. 160 out of 800 answered extreme. And so that is 0 0.20. And 16 out of 800 answered no response. And so that's 0 0.02. Okay, so that's the probability distribution. Okay, we're just taking the number of outcomes in each of the uh, uh, simple events and then dividing by the total number of trials, okay, which was 800. What is the probability that a participant in the survey answered that he or she had experienced an extreme stress level? Okay, so we're looking for the probability of answering extreme. All right. And so we can just read that right off the ta table. 0 0.20. Okay, 0 0.20. So 0.2 is our probability. We could also write that as 20%. But don't get confused because this is not 0.2%. <laughs> it's either 0.2 or 20%. I would suggest just leaving things as decimals unless there's a reason not to. Okay. Um, and then our other question is asking what, um, what's the probability uh, that the participant in the survey answered that he or she had not experienced 
a low level. Okay, so basically we're we're asking for oh x oh hold on a minute. <laughs> I just realized I had not experienced a low level of stress. Okay, I just realized that my answer in my notes is not uh, what the question was asking. So so probability of not low. So basically the complement of low. Alright? So not low. Now there's a couple of different ways that we could um, we could answer that. Now we could take and take all of the probabilities that are not low and add them up. So we could add up 0.44 plus 0.20 plus uh, 0.02 and add those up. So what do I get? It looks like I get 0 0.66. I'm doing this in my head because I didn't <laughs> I didn't do this correctly in my notes. Um, but the other way we could do that is we could take 100% um, probability minus the probability of low. Okay, so we're taking, it's, it's, it's basically complementary counting. You know, there's 100% so chance of, of something happening and 0.34% chance, 0.34% 0.34 probability that somebody answered low, so if we subtract those two, we get the same thing. Okay? So you can do it either way, but it's good to point out that, you know, rather than adding up all those three, we can take um, the total probability, which is of, of, of all of the sa um, simple events, and subtract the probability of being low and then we'll get the probability of not being low, of the, of the stress of level being something other than low. All right? All right, I've got one more example here. This was one I was going to have you guys try on your own. So if you want to pause the video and give this one a try, you can do that now. All right, so let's take a look at this problem. All right, so according to the U.S. Census Bureau, um, the 2008 income of U.S. families was described by the following table. Okay, so we have a bunch of income levels, and then we have a number of families um, listed. Now, notice that this is in thousands. So this is actually 28 million um, uh, uh people. Okay, so just everything has is just move the decimal place. We just we can just move the decimal place three three over, but we can work in thousands. That's fine. That's not a big deal. We'll just work in thousands. So, um, so we we, we want to um, find the probability distribution associated with this date data associated. It should be a D there, shouldn't I? All kinds of typos. All right. So. Um, now, the problem is, right now, we don't know how many families we surveyed, right? We don't know how many families we surveyed, but we can find out by just adding up the number of families, okay? And because these categories encompass everybody. Every family in the United States is going to be in one of these categories, right? So, uh, if we add these up, I got 117... 043.8 thousand. Okay. okay, that's how many families would have been. Oops, thousand. Okay, that's how many families would have been surveyed. Okay, so even though they didn't get give us how many families were surveyed, this we can just add up all the numbers because every family has to fall in, fall into these one of these income levels. All right, so now we've got to calculate the probability of each of these, um, or basically the relative frequency is what we're doing. So um, for an income less than 25,000, we would just take this number, 28,943.7, and divide it by the total. Okay, now I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write that out because I'm just going to give you the results. Um, this one came out to be point two, four, seven, three. Okay. If I divide this, this number by the total, I get point 
0.1493. For this one I got 0.1792. Um, this one I got 0.1191. And this one I got 0. Uh, 0.2051. Alright, so and I got those numbers just by taking the number of families in that income bracket and dividing by the total number of families. All right, so what's the probability? Probability that a randomly selected family has an income below 25,000. So we can just write, read that right off the table. So I'm just going to write this as income less than 25,000. Probability of an income less than 25,000. Just reading it off the table, it's 0.2473. All right. What's the probability that um, a randomly selected family has an income between 50,000, between 50,000 and 99,000? Okay, so 50,000. Okay, so between, so we want our income to be between 50,000 and 999. Sorry, no, 99,999. Okay. So, um, I think this is probably less than or equal to. Doesn't really matter too much because we're just going to look at the table. So, basically, we're looking at these two income brackets, right, for part C. This, we're looking at these two income brackets, so we can just add up. They're mutually exclusive, right? They're simple events, right? This, we, we, we divided them down into simple events, or uh, but they're mutually exclusive. You're not going to have an income in both of those categories. So um, we're just going to add up um, 0.719. Whoops, I wrote that backwards. Uh, okay, instead of getting the eraser, I'm just going to 0.1792 plus um, 0.1191. Add those together, and I got uh, 0.2983. All right, a few more questions here. Um, what's the probability that a randomly selected family has an income of 75,000 or more? All right, so 75,000 or more is these two brackets. So this is part D. It's those two brackets. Um, so again, we're just going to add them up. So the probability that the income is greater than or equal to $75,000 is just going to be the sum of 0 0.1191 plus 0 0.2051. I'm just taking these two numbers and adding together. And we will get 0.3242. All right, what's the probability that a family has an income of less than 50,000? Probability of income less than or equal to 50,000. Okay. So you can see that that would be these two brackets. So we're just going to add them up. It's already in here. 0 0.2493 plus 0 0.2473 and we get 0 0.4966. Almost 50% chance that income is less than 50,000. All right, now on this one I'm going to scroll down, but we're going, to, we're going to lose our table. But it's a fairly simple one, so that's okay. Um, and actually, actually, we can still see what we need to know. All right, so this one's asking what's the probability that the income is greater than a hundred thousand? What's the probability of having an income greater than a hundred thousand? Now you can see that is just this event right here. All right, so 0.2051, and that's it. We don't have to add anything because it's just that one bracket, one income bracket. All right, well, <laughs> it 
So there you go. Um, we will uh, join you again soon. Bye.